from the gospel used many, many times in various stewardship sermons. Don't get excited or worried. I'm not going to preach a stewardship sermon. You didn't come on the wrong night. Well, not entirely anyway. Many times I've heard this metaphor that Jesus used about camels going through the eye of a needle explained like this. In Jerusalem, there's a narrow gate that was called uh, the slain was the eye of the needle. And if a merchant came into that gate, he had to completely unpack his camel, lead the camel through, carry all the goods through by hand, and then repack the camel on the other side. The point being that great riches, lots of goods, hamper one's ability to serve God because he has to spend so much time taking care of all the stuff. Now, there are other biblical scholars who vigorously disagree and say that there was no such gate in Jerusalem, and that Jesus' metaphor here is really intended by Jesus to be just as ludicrous as it sounds. It is easier for a literal camel to pass through the literal eye of a sewing needle than for a rich man to enter heaven. Jesus was trying, they say, to show us how ridiculous it is to trust in wealth. For salvation and how it, having great wealth really makes it almost impossible to be a child of God. So once more for me, I come to the point that I also always so often come to of saying, so what? Who cares? Because the point is the same either way, right? Possessions impact faith. The more I possess and control, the more I am tempted to believe that I am self-sufficient and that I don't have to depend on anyone, including God. The more I possess and control, the more I am tempted to believe that all that stuff is mine and mine to do with as I wish. The more I possess and control, the more I am tempted to focus all of my energy on this mortal life instead of focusing on eternal life with God. Now, interestingly enough, King Solomon makes this exact same point in Ecclesiastes, our Old Testament reading for tonight, only from quite a different angle. See, with Jesus, we're always tempted to say, well, yeah, he can say that. He's Jesus. He doesn't have any connection to money. He doesn't need money for anything. He's God. Of course, he can say stuff like that. He's never had a sick kid that has to go to the doctor. We don't have enough money. He's never had a car repair bill that's due on Friday. He's never had to make that rent payment at the end of the month that you don't have. How does he know? And why would he care? He's God. So then you have King Solomon, one of Jesus' ancestors, by the way, who has the same thing to say about money, but who was enormously connected to money. He was the wealthiest man in the Bible. I, I know you guys know that King Solomon was rich, but does anybody really know how rich he was? They say that he was, or stands to this day, as the richest man ever to have lived on this earth. If you translated his money into today's terms, they say he would have over $2.1 trillion. That's how rich King Solomon was. And I can't figure out what a trillion is. I mean, other than a whole bunch of zeros. So I had to look up on the internet to figure out some kind of method to try to understand how big a trillion is. Did you know that if you are 80 years old today, in order to have $2.1 trillion, 
you would have had to have, have saved $75 million every single day of your life. That's how big a trillion is. 75 million every single day of your life if you're 80 years old, then you would have 2.1 trillion dollars. So it's interesting that King Solomon, who has literally all the money in the world, speaks so disparagingly about money. He talks about it like it's worthless. That very thing that so many people covet. The richest man of all time is the one who says, sweet is the sleep of a laborer. You can almost hear him saying, oh boy, would I like that guy's life. Who goes out and does a day's work and then is able to go to sleep. He even says that the riches hurt the owner. Sounds an awful lot like camels squeezing through the eyes of needles, doesn't it? Beyond being ridiculously impossible, think how painful it would be for the camel. I mean, it would literally break every bone in the camel's body, right? That sounds hideous when you really think about it. And it is hideous. It's likewise just as hideous watching the way money and possessions crush human beings over time. Solomon learned that the, the real joy of this life was in the labor not in the remuneration. Adam and Eve were placed in the garden to work. Because work is where we find joy. Work is where we find satisfaction in life. Money always confuses us. In fact, where we find the most satisfaction oftentimes is in the work that we volunteer. Because then we're not confused by the money. Because as soon as we assign money to it, then we assign value to it. Because the society values money. And so then our work is suddenly measured by the amount of money we make instead of the amount of good work that we do. I mean, is a, a doctor more valuable than a checker at Jewel? Is a pro basketball player more valuable than a doctor? It's hard for us not to think in those terms because of the money they make. Or, from God's perspective, is everyone who uses his gifts to God's glory and for the good of his fellow human being equally valuable? Equally valuable. As he contributes to his, his society by using God's gifts. See, when Christ died on the cross, all of our sins were forgiven. All of us were given eternal life in paradise. We all have the same thing. What more could we possibly want? So at this point, all that matters is that we spend our time on this earth glorifying God and keeping our faith strong with his word and his sacraments. Faith given to us in baptism, faith given to us in his word, that is the thing that grabs a hold of the gift of salvation. None of the stuff that we pack on our camels is going to do us any good in just a few short years. And the danger is that the more goods that we have, the more we will be tempted to trust in material wealth instead of trusting God. Sweet is the sleep of the laborer, whether he eats little or much, but the full stomach of the rich will not let him sleep. If you have very little materially, but your faith is powerful, you can relax. So what if you have an old car? So what if your house isn't as nice as houses in another neighborhood? You have eternity waiting for you. You belong to paradise already. What would you have to worry about? On the other hand, if all of your trust 
is in material things, then you have a lot to do, a lot to guard and defend. And frankly, it would be normal to worry. Because there's just so many hours in a day, right? And you have no control over most of what happens. You have no control over the stock market. You have no control over your income, really. Then you have to pay attention to sports and, and toys and, and hobbies, all things that come with a material world. Well, who has time for God? How will you nourish your face? I mean, really, you kind of have to ask yourself, is making money more important than building your relationship with God? Is playing sports or camping or sleeping in more important than nourishing your relationship with God? We really just have very little time on this earth. And we don't want to waste our time. We don't want to sacrifice our faith for any one of a whole host of things that King Solomon calls vanity. For how hard it will be to shove that camel through that eye of a needle. 